good good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Emiliano Gennorini speaking, and I want to give you uh, our uh, welcome to the fourth session of our uh, learning series. We'll uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, the tablet and uh, the tablet compression, and uh, this is a, a part of our learning series. This is already the third session of this series. And uh, the first one was on raw material, the second on drying and, uh, and granulation, the third on tumble blender. And uh, you can see from the link here that uh, uh, all the uh, record uh, recording are available on YouTube. So if you want uh, to review the, um, the session, you are free to review it anytime. We will do the same with the tablet compression monitoring and also uh, next week uh, with the other location uh, devices. The, um, it's important uh, that uh, if you are having trouble uh, with the uh, audio connection, you can uh, um, use your computer uh, um, speaker and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, microphone in case. Uh, and uh, otherwise you can connect uh, by phone and so to use the phone the, the, the phone connection. Um, it's really important uh, to have a quick look uh, at the program because unfortunately, and I promise you to be very fast, we will go through a welcome and company profile, but uh, uh, and, and also something regarding the product line. But especially today, we'll spend time on uh, tablet compression, tablet coating, and uh, uh, Christina will make a nice uh, uh, hands on session on the partial least square, so the algorithm that is used for uh, building a quantitative model. At the end, there is the uh, question and answer session that will be held by me and Christina. I kindly ask you, like last time, to send your question in the uh, question um, tools that you have in the in the go in the go, go to webinar, and uh, we'll try to reply to a selection on that directly online, but to all the question uh, um, by the end of the day. Today's speaker, myself. And Christina, I think that we don't have to spend too much time here because uh, a lot of you know us uh, already. Uh, the company, again, Viavi is an American company, two big uh, business unit. One is called NCE, working on network and service enablement, and the other one, OSP, Optical Securities and Performance Product. Micronir is the OSP uh, business unit. This is a, a little of history of our company. We have a long history started uh, in 1948 as Oakley, up to now that we are VR. The OSP market segment, uh, we are active in the OSP team uh, in different market segments uh, from the consumer electronic to the government aerospace to anti-country fitting for the banknote, especially for pigment that are used uh, in the banknote and uh, automotive and spectral sensing. Our headquarter is in Santa Rosa in California and uh, there we have the uh, R&D team, the manufacturing and uh, the sales and marketing team. Uh, Christina and I, we are based in Italy. What is the vision of the Micronir? The vision of the Micronir is uh, to create a smart world, starting uh, with an evolution that is pretty similar to the first watch evolution, from a mechanical watch to a smart watch. This is a thing that we have already seen in the past with the computers. The computer that they became smaller and smaller up nowadays to a smartwatch or to a tablet uh, where you can do a lot of stuff that in the past was even more difficult to do with a traditional desktop computer. Enabling a smart world for us means to work uh, um, through four cardinal points. The miniaturization, the device is very small. The, 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 the 1700 ES is 64 grams less than five centimeters performance. The devices are with a signal to noise that is, let's say, enough for a professional application. I mean, roughly 25,000 to one. So it's not a device for consumer spectroscopy. It's a device for professional application. 
the affordability, good price compared to the fit uh, for, for, for compared to the purpose that we want to have for this device. And the connectivity that can be connectivity in the cloud for handle device, but for process device that are on the right hand side, we have for sure connectivity through the OPC UA and DA that enable you to get uh, a very uh, easy way to interface the NIR measurement with the uh, HMI of your, um, of your production equipment. What is the technology inside? The technology is a VAVI technology called a linear variable filter that is one dimensional, continuously varying bandpass filter. This device is a very uh, compact, lightweight and robust, but especially it doesn't have any moving part or free space optic. The original design was developed for a, a NASA uh, mission, and you can see here, uh, as you can see here. The uh, advantage of this technology is for sure that we have everything in a very small uh, and teeny device that enable us to do unique application. Last week, we spent time talking about the blending application, where for sure to have a lightweight device is a big plus compared to having a bulky device. But using the L-Web filter, it doesn't allow not only to have a lightweight device, but we have also some other device advantage, like the fact that we are not using any laser. So in terms of maintenance, the maintenance is really reduced, saving a couple of thousand dollars per year for the laser replacement. Uh, on top of this, uh, we are using lamps that are rated uh, for uh, a lifetime or 40,000 hours. I would say around four or five years. And this is another advantage because compared to a traditional optical bench, we have the possibility to reduce a lot the cost of ownership because the maintenance is really reduced. And so this is really important because uh, uh, using uh, um, leveraging on this feature, we can move from a traditional bench to a smart sensor. It's also important to know that we don't have moving parts, so there is nothing that can be disaligned during the time. And it allows us to have an incredible, outstanding long-term stability, 100% transferability between the units, and we claim to be a fiber optic free company. So we don't use any fiber optic inside. And we know that the fiber optic, especially in the process, can be not so easy to manage for the aging or because are ah, sensible to the temperature variation. Our product line, super quickly, instrument, on-site, PATs uh, and uh, uh, 1700 are available in uh, two different ways, OEM device or end-user device. For pharmaceutical company, we provide our end user version that is a, a fully um, that is equipped with special accessory like flange adaptation extended probe and so on but especially we have our software that is full 21st CFR part 11 compliance with the possibility to uh, deploy validation following the USP 1119 and we are working on the 1856 uh, version of the release of the USP and uh, also on the EP2240. On top, we have a full chemometric package that uh, since uh, we came up with a uh, 3.1 uh, version of the software, it includes spectral match value, moving block, PCA, and also PLS, that will be the topic today of our uh, practical section. Obviously, for customers that want to have more, we can use the um, you can use our software using other chemometric package like Simca, Unscrambler, or Solo for developing analytical uh, method. This is our uh, baby, the 1700ES is uh, the original micron here. And here you have the on-site W on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, you have the PATU and the PATW. Both U and W can be good for a pharmaceutical application 
in the process. The on-site is more for uh, um, raw material identification. In case you need more in terms of safety, we have devices that are dedicated to the hazard location. The PATU is now is called PATUX, and the W is called WX. Process analytical technology. This is the key point. The raw material are by definition, by nature, let me say, variable. If we have a fixed process we end, we, uh, that we keep constant and validated, we will end up to have, at the end, tablets that are variable. The real aim of the process analytical technology is the process understanding. So we want to understand how the mm, process can be, uh, let's say, impacted by variation of influenced by the variation in the raw materials. If we know how the difference in the raw material can be digested by the process, we can assure a better quality of our tablets. This is a key point that is well received. And uh, here you have uh, some statements that are important. First of all, the first one is saying you need to know how the critical attributes are influencing your process. The second statement that I really like is quality control cannot be, the quality cannot be tested into the product. It should be built into the product. That is quite different because here we are bringing up the concept of quality by design. Clearly, on the left hand side, we have the quality by test. So the uh, approach that we are used to, or we were used to, let me say, where we just develop the process as we think that is better to, to, to make it without, uh, let's say, a real process control in line. And on the right hand side, we have the quality by design, where for sure there is a huge, bigger investment in the beginning to understand the process. And the learning phase is for sure longer than in the previous one, but afterward, on the product, if you look at the life cycle of the product, it's clear that the cost, they, they are kept better under control forever. Traditional approach is another important thing to point out. The process is developed, frozen completely, and eventually validated using three commercial purchases. The quality is the quality that you can only check in the laboratory, but the process is a completely black box. With the PAT approach, we are talking about real-time analysis, in line or online. The aim is process understanding, understand the influence or the critical attribute on the process in order to ensure that the uh, final outcome, the tablet in our case, are completely under control. Obviously, in this case, there is a help that is coming from the traditional statistic and also from the multivariate analysis. But the variability of the process, we don't try to keep it frozen, but we try to manage the variability. And this is an important milestone. Where is possible to install a micron? Wherever you want in a pharmaceutical production, raw material, blend uniformity, granulation, loss on dry, and today we will discuss about compaction and dry. So let's go immediately uh, because I promised to stay inside the 60 minutes today. Last week was uh, a little bit longer than our expectation. We can split into different ways uh, to produce a tablet. One is raw material blending, direct compression. The other one is getting involved the granulation. It's clear that uh, raw material, granulation, blending, uh, uh, and compression are all phases where, let's say, we can have a variability. The variability, if it's not, uh, let's say, understood, it could create, uh, let's say, some variation at the end of the process. The interesting stuff that uh, during this learning series, we analyze it step by step from the raw material, granulation and drying, tableting, all the different phases. And we saw that using an NIR device, we can keep well under control all the different phases. 
but uh, uh, let's assume that now we go uh, to the tableting machine we produce tablet and once we have a couple of million of tablets we find that there is a problem and this problem is normally found only when the tablet is analyzed in the laboratory this is for sure something that we want to avoid as more as possible so our idea is to find a way to monitor directly online the compressing phase this phase uh, the tablet critical attribute are basically the particle size the moisture the density and the morphology depending on that if we want to describe the uh, let's say perfect uh, recipe is free flowing so the product uh, has to move uh, each other uh, in a proper way they have to be uh, let's say in a narrow and homogeneous range of particle size because this is really the key point to avoid segregation let's say or the mixing they have to be enough uh, uh, they, they have to have an, a, a good cohesion between the different particles but they don't have to stick too much in the table press the reason for the uh, inhomogeneity they can come segregation in blending the missing in blending or also in the transfer phase bad storage i mean you mix up your product you leave in the tumble blender your powder and uh, maybe you leave it there for uh, two three four uh, even one night hour even one night it come up that the following day when you do the tablets you find out that your product is uh, not homogeneous so it's really important to try to do what uh, is uh, shown here uh, this is uh, and i uh, want to, to to make a special thanks to uh, to Dima for uh, uh, for this test uh, is uh, a, a tablet press where we uh, installed uh, on the same machine two uh, microneer one is installed at the loading chute and the other one is at the feed frame this is a fantastic application for the microneer because uh, the having a very small and thin device you can attach two device uh, maybe 20 centimeter far each other that is something uh, very uh, interesting and uh, here it's a little uh, uh, chicken and egg because it's better to use the feed frame or it's better to go to the loading chute is a quite complex decision to take here we decided to try to make an experiment uh, you can see here the uh, machine the two machine working uh, together we decided to make an experiment installing both on the on the on, on the table press this is the experiment obviously uh, we didn't uh, use any uh, api but uh, to mimic the api VR, we decided to use talc and the matrix uh, uh, it is lactose so we prepared three different uh, uh, batches of lactose with one three and five percent of the NIR spectra are acquired every second, okay? And uh, the white powder uh, is uh, flowing in front of uh, the NIR almost continuously. This is the target formulation, so our target is to get 3%. This is something, I guess, uh, uh, pretty unique, where we have the spectra in the uh, feed frame on the uh, sorry on the uh, on the loading chute on the left hand side and on the right hand side the spectra from the feed frame it's clear that uh, installing an nir in the chute in the loading chute is uh, uh, somehow uh, better from the spectroscopical point of view because uh, you can see uh, a very small variation of a spectra all over the, 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 the spectrum and there is only the talc variation that is incredible evident and uh, i highlighted in yellow in the other side you see that uh, uh, despite the fact 
that uh, in the talc region um, I, I will end over the presentation so you can uh, um, zoom in and see that uh, uh, there is also there a, 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 a variability there is also variability due to the fact that in a lot of cases you have the uh, the star inside uh, the, the, the the propeller inside that is uh, creating uh, uh, this homogeneity uh, somehow but the message that i want to drop is that it is technically possible to install the sensor in both the position we will see in a while that there are some advantage and some disadvantage on both the um, solution. What it is this one? This is a moving block standard deviation. Okay, so on the uh, epsilon, uh, on, on, on the x-axis we have time, okay, uh, basically the number of tetra, uh, and on the y we have standard deviation, okay. Uh, we defined uh, a, a threshold, okay, that is the, uh, the, the, the red line here. And uh, it's interesting to see that uh, when we start, uh, there was uh, a variation that uh, goes above the threshold and was probably due to the fact that we loaded 1%, 3%, 5%, and we stashed the, the, the product for a while before starting the compression. Afterward, so there was a sort of, uh, um, how can I say, mixing between the three concentration or the two concentration. Um, once uh, we are feeding uh, with the 1%, uh, the standard deviation is uh, low and is in, within the limit. When it starts uh, to feed uh, with the talc 3%, boom, it goes up. When it's only 3%, is again stable when uh, the uh, NIR is measuring 5%, it goes up again. And afterward, uh, when it's only 5%, it uh, goes down. This is very important because we can keep under control the process very well. Normally, and Christina, she's uh, really keen on this, uh, uh, fewer is the best. But here I want to uh, show you a couple of ways to display the same data set. This is not the moving block standard deviation, but is the moving block mean. So the average of our spectra, uh, of, of our area of our spectra, let's say in a more proper way. You see that uh, there is the region of uh, uh, 1% that is on top, the region of 3% here, and the region of 5% that is uh, down on, on, on the lower side of the graph. It's clear that uh, uh, if uh, the moving block goes to zero when there is no variation, here is going not to zero, but to a constant value that can be higher, lower, or, 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 in, the, or in the middle. No? And uh, uh, we can easily create a control chart and we can easily define when, where our product uh, is uh, within the specification and where is not. In the specification and we can uh, have an alarm in this case. This is uh, uh, the similar uh, uh, stuff uh, done uh, using uh, a PC1 versus PC2 score. Again, uh, you really see very well from the left to the right, talc, transition, uh, talc 3%, or talc 1%, transition 1%, 3%. Talc 3%, transition 3, 5, talc 5%. We can express the same variability using the PC1 versus the time. Uh, it's just a little bit more juggled. Probably here it would have been better to take the PCA and make a moving block not on the original spectrum, but on the principal component one. What is the plus of doing a principal component analysis? The plus on doing a principal component analysis is clearly that if we look at the loadings that are giving, are explaining us the importance that a, a set of wavelengths has in defining the principal component one, we can see that it's clearly coming from the talc. So it's really, we are really able to monitor 
the talc variation in a very easy and reliable way. What are the conclusions here? The conclusions are that it's possible to install on the loading chute. We have a better, um, as you can see from, uh, from, from the picture here, a better flow of a product inside because it's uh, sliding uh, continuously but in a very constant way without uh, air voice, uh, without changing speed, without the influence of the paddle. There is, uh, from the other side, the possibility to work directly on the feed frame. The data that I showed are specifically on the uh, loading chute, but we have the same set with a similar result. I didn't want just to repeat it twice for the feed frame. Um, the advantage of the feed frame is the last second before the compression. The advantage of using the NIR at the loading chute is that we are before going into the feed frame. So in case that we find a problem, we can stop the feed frame and we don't need afterward to clean the tableting machine and so on. So it's really possible both uh, uh, if we can, uh, we can suggest uh, to buy two sensor, one for one, one for the other. We want to show you a case study where we work it with both and uh, what we have found out. Another changing a little bit, going one step forward, uh, uh, one step ahead, uh, we can uh, um, we want to show you uh, this experiment that has been done, uh, uh, and uh, I want to thank you, uh, Frau Indector, for, uh, for, 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 the, for the help on uh, uh, coating process monitoring. Uh, the coating is a critical step and uh, uh, to give the right taste, the right color to the tablet, and so on. And to keep under control this process uh, is uh, important. Uh, this is an example where we made uh, two different, uh, we, we, we used uh, two different coating agents, the OPA Drive 1, cellulose base, uh, specific case blue, and the OPA Drive 2, PVA base, that uh, in this specific case is uh, white. Uh, we try to have one cellulose and one PVA just to have two different kind of coatings. And uh, per each uh, um, coat, coating, we ran we ran four batches, okay, in order to have something uh, interesting from the scientific point of view. In order to avoid uh, all the um, how can I say uh, reproducibility and to improve the reproducibility and to keep uh, constant the process, we decided to keep constant the flow rate the inlet air temperature uh, in, and, 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 and the product temperature was almost uh, uh, constant. So we kept all the process parameter as more uh, as possible constant. This is how we installed the, the Micronear. The Micronear was installed uh, close to the spray gun or directly on the spray gun. It was uh, installed using a um, extended probe in this specific case. The tip of the extended probe is in direct contact with tablet. The device has a special jacket where we can, uh, um, let's say, um, uh, cool the device uh, with water. This is necessary because the temperature is uh, uh, inside the uh, coating uh, um, pen quite high, could be even 80 degrees. This is a, a video that is uh, showing you how the measurement were uh, performed. And uh, uh, here you have uh, the result, uh, result that are in this specific case for a uh, uh, weight uh, gain. So we measured uh, uh, 30 tablets at different time that we take out, that we took out from, uh, from the pan. And uh, we uh, took uh, the spectrum uh, or NIR spectrum at the time uh, that uh, we uh, took the sample, and we built a calibration for the OPA Drive 1 and for the OPA Drive 2. 
Same thing has been done uh, with a uh, coating uh, thickness. Uh, and uh, uh, in this case, uh, we use uh, a micrometer to, to, to measure. And here you can see that the uh, correlation between the theoretical value and the predicted value are really, really, really uh, similar. We also made a validation. And uh, here you have uh, um, on another batch the weight uh, variation over the time. And you have in green the NIR measurement, and in blue, actually is in purple, sorry, the primary method. Okay, so the, the, the balance on 30 tablets. And you can see that uh, the two series of data are almost uh, the same. So uh, with the NIR, we can easily follow the um, increase of weight and also the increase of thickness as uh, is uh, shown uh, in this uh, slide. This is a uh, whole uh, from my uh, side. Um, I leave the stage uh, to Christina. Yes, I'm show. Okay, screen now. I'm sharing the screen. Yes, can you zoom, see my screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. So, of course, you already know why I'm here. Uh, just to summarize for the one of you that have never participated here to the seminar, uh, the, uh, my activity is mainly based on extract information from the NIR signal. So, I'm a chemometrician, basically. Uh, and I work with Viavi thanks, thanks to collaboration with my university, that is the University of Genova in Italy. So what we have to do uh, today is to work directly on the MicroNIR Pro software to understand how to develop all the uh, models and the graph that Emiliano showed in the presentation. So the version of the software is the MicroNIR Pro software 3.1, and we will see together an advanced functionality today that is the batch prediction functionality. And you will see the advantage of having this batch prediction inside the software. Uh, but first of all, let's focus on the case study. Uh, so I'm focusing on the coating monitoring, so the last part of Emiliano's presentation. And my aim is to predict the weight and the thickness of the tablet online during the coating phase. So I don't want to stop the coating pan and to analyze the tablet, but I want to know directly online in a process that the process analytical technology give me directly the answer that I want to know for knowing when I have to stop uh, my coating pan and how is going the coating inside the, uh, the process. For doing this, we need two different steps. The first one is the model development. And I usually call this step uh, the training phase because we need uh, to teach to the NIR to um, give us the right answer. So give us the weight and the thickness of the tablet. And how we can do this, we have to uh, calibrate our model, acquiring spectra and giving uh, the tablet to the lab for obtaining the weight and the thickness. When this phase of the model development of the NIR uh, learning phase is finished, we can use the model that we just developed for the prediction of unknown batches. So now the NIR can be used without the help of uh, the chemical analysis or the physical analysis like in this case. So we don't need the lab to understand what is happening inside our coating pan. I, I told you that I need the reference data. So I will try to uh, summarize a little bit the data set that we will use today. Uh, is a data set of uh, coating, as you already know. So it's a process that continue a long time for a while, for around 60 minutes. And we start for uncoated tablets until finished tablets with all uh, the coating well, uh, well fixed. 
Okay, and during this process, we acquired one spectrum every 10 seconds. So a really, really big amount of data. We are speaking around uh, 360 uh, spectra in, during the coating process, but we don't have the possibility to stop the coating pan, uh, pan every 10 seconds to understand what is happening. So a smaller amount of uh, samples, so a smaller uh, uh, aliquots of uh, tablets were used for understanding in the lab what's, what was happening in, uh, uh, in the process. In this case, 25 aliquots of the sample, each aliquot is uh, 30 uh, tablets, was um, taken, sampled in the coating pan. So every two minutes, more or less, we took 30 tablets from the coating pan. And we uh, went to the lab for having the weight and the thickness measurement. Uh, how we perform these two analyses, of course, we um, used an analytical balance uh, for uh, weighting the 30 tablets, and we do the mean of the weight of the 30 tablets, and the same for the micrometer. We measured the 30 tablets and we obtained the mean thickness. So now what we need is an algorithm that is able to um, correlate uh, the information in, embodied within the NIR spectra and the data, the numbers coming from the lab. This algorithm is a really, really well-known uh, algorithm and is the partial least square regression. Uh, this algorithm is able to understand the covariance structure between what? Between the predictors that, uh, that in this case are the spectra and the response variable. In this case, we have two response variable, the weight and the thickness. So we are building two different PLS models, one for the weight and one for the thickness. Once your PLS model is uh, trained and validated, you can use it directly for prediction of uh, unknown batches, and you can rely on the results that uh, uh, the NIR is giving you, because the system uh, was trained exactly with your tablet in your environment in the process. Okay, but let's take a look together uh, to the software. As you know, we are in, develop in the developer space. Here you can find the data analysis panel. And I told you that I want to do PLS, so I'm clicking on partial least square regression. Remember that you have to click on new for starting a new project. So this is a PLS for coding and I have to retrieve my data. So I click with the mouse, on, uh, with the right button of the mouse, and I create a calibration set that includes the calibration of the coating. So these are the spectra of the 25 aliquots that I also analyzed in the lab. So I know that this first sample correspond to the first moment in which I sampled the tablet for the lab. Then I wait 12 spectra for taking other uh, 30 tablets. And then at spectra 23, I take other 30 tablets. So you can see that the spectra are not consecutive because they are just the 25 uh, that, has a correspondence, that have a correspondence in the lab measurement. So I um, retrieve all my spectra, and now I have to add, right click of the mouse, the reference data. Here I have an Excel file in which I have the weight and the thickness value that comes from the lab, and I have to create inside the micro NIR the two variables. So the first variable name is weight and is expressed in here you can see that I have the unit, so it is milligrams, and I add the variable, and I also have the thickness, and I need to copy from here because I don't have 
the right letter into my keyboard. So I will use the copy paste and I add the variable weight and thickness. So now I can copy the two columns. Control C. I come here. I verify that I have I am in the first uh, row and I copy all the value. So remember, these are the value from the lab. These are the corresponding spectra. Now I can apply some data pretreatment to the spectra, and I can compute my model. How much component we want to uh, use? Just five. Okay, I already evaluated this uh, uh, panel of the model, so trust me that this model worked properly with two factors. So this is uh, our uh, result of the PLS algorithm. We will focus on these two graphs here, the scores and the predicted versus reference. So let's start from the scores. Every point here is uh, one spectrum. And if I color the sequence with 25 different colors, so one for each spectrum, you can see that I have a, a really evident profile of my process in the scores. Uh, this evident profile is resumed here in the predicted versus reference uh, um, graph. This is a really uh, crucial graph for understanding PLS because here I have the reference value. It means the number that were obtained in the lab. And here I have the predicted value that are the one that were predicted by the micro NIR. If here I add the target line that is the B sector of this uh, space, you can see that my points are exactly lying uh, along this line. And this is for the weight, because I already told you one model for each variable. So this is the model for weight. But I can also ask for the model of thickness, and you can see, yes, the dots are a little bit more dispersed, but still really, really nice distribution along the B sector. So I'm happy with this, uh, with this model, and I can save it. PLS coating saved. Okay, great. But uh, do you remember that I also acquired all the bunch of spectra a long time, also when I didn't have uh, the correspondent lab, lab analysis? Well, perfect. I want to know the thickness and the weight also uh, for the other spectra. So I will use this model for predict the number that I didn't measure in the lab. So for doing this, uh, I have, first of all, to create a method. I will go quite fast here because uh, maybe you already know the function method configuration. So this is our method for coating. I don't know if I click on new, so I do again, method coating. I want the default configuration. OK, I save it and I go in the workflow and I will add here the model that I've created right now via VPLS. The model was PLS coating. I add it and I want to see thickness and weight. Perfect. OK, so I can save again and look at the output and I want to see my results and I also want to see some graph. So this is the model and this is the graph for weight and this is the graph for thickness and I save again. The method was updated successfully. Thank you. Now I'm ready to use the batch prediction. Remember, green icon, batch prediction. I select the method, is the one that I've done right now, so method coating, and I select the project. In this case, I'm taking the validation coating, so all the spectra that I have acquired, but I don't have the data from the lab. I retrieve the data. It takes a while because they are 300 spectra, Okay, I want to see all the results. I apply the method on the spectra. And I obtain 
the weight and the thickness. And I can export these two columns in a CSV file. So this is the export of the validation set. I can save. And if we open together this uh, uh, CSV file, okay, we can directly plot and represent the trending of, of the weight and the trending of the thickness. So in this case, you have the weight value and the thickness value for all the 300 spectra that were acquired along the entire coating process. Okay, this was done on a bunch of spectra that were already acquired. But if I want to use the model that, I, uh, that I've just developed for a new batch, what I have to do? So I come back, I enter the predict new sample, I find here my method. I can click on my method, that is method coating. Oh, I think that I've done too much click. Okay, sorry. So here you have weight and thickness. I can use just a dummy project that I have here that is not, because I, I don't have a coating pen here with me. So I do just a trial. Now I take my micro NIR and I scan the dark. Now I scan the reference, so the spectralon. Okay, and now I start scanning my desk. So the spectra are not so interesting, but just to see you the multivariate control chart that you have. So you can see that I'm continuously acquiring the spectra and I already have the prediction of weight and the prediction of thickness. So you can see here that I have weight and thickness that are calculated directly during the acquisition phase. So I can reproduce online and live the profile that we saw in the batch prediction in the CSV file. So one time you um, have the coating method, you can apply it directly in uh, the uh, coating pen. So it was quite fast because I want to show you lots of functionalities, but I can stop here and uh, open the uh, session for the questions. Okay, so Emiliano, are you here? Thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, uh, for the presentation and uh, uh, for the exercise with the software, Christina. Um, I wanted to uh, select uh, uh, some questions uh, that, uh, that we got. Uh, one is uh, uh, something that maybe I was not uh, uh, clear enough uh, uh, during my presentation. When uh, we uh, connect uh, the micronear uh, inside uh, the uh, coating pen, uh, it's clear that uh, the temperature uh, uh, of the inside the coating pen or the air inside the coating pen can be easily uh, 75 or 80 degrees. Is not possible under the circumstances uh, to uh, install the device as it is, but it requires uh, a uh, cooling jacket and actually is in the, in, in, in the picture, but it's a very simple uh, uh, design that uh, you need uh, to, to make. Uh, the, the other thing uh, is uh, uh, what is the, 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 the thickness uh, that uh, we can analyze uh, with the, with the micronear uh, in the coating. Uh, I don't know, Christina, do you want to take it or? Uh... No, go ahead. If I have to add something, I will add then. Okay. Uh, basically, um, one of the first adopts that we have when we started to do uh, this uh, application was uh, if there was a certain uh, point where the coating was too thick 
and the NIR signal was not uh, uh, enough strong uh, to go in the other side. Let me explain better. When you have a coating, you have basically coating and the nut of the tablet in the other side. And basically, uh, it's important that uh, the NIR bin is going completely through the coating and is uh, keep on reading the nut in the other side. No? And uh, actually, uh, I think that uh, uh, we can arrive uh, uh, to uh, probably uh, easily uh, 400 micron without uh, uh, problem. Obviously, it depends a lot from the material that you are using from the coating agent. Uh, maybe, Christina, you can uh, uh, say something uh, because we have observed in some cases not linear, uh, uh, good PLS, but not linear. Yes, yes, we... we yes, of course, uh, what happened is sometimes as in this example that uh, I showed you, uh, with just one factor, you can underline non-linear behavior of the uh, thickness and of the weight because I can imagine that also uh, physical properties of the process can influence the increment of the thickness that maybe cannot be completely linear from a certain point of view. Uh, but the PLS has this big advantage that you can choose the complexity of the model. So in our case, if I just use, and maybe I can uh, uh, show you uh, this, uh, this difference, if for you is interesting, if I just uh, um, recall the model that we just uh, made together, okay, it was called PLS coating. Okay, if you look at this graph, you can see that if I add the regression line and the target line in this graph, it seems that we have a non-linearity uh, a different shape uh, in respect to uh, the uh, normal regression line that we expect. But you can see here that maybe with one factor, I'm explaining a bunch of variability because I'm around the 90%, but maybe it's not enough to understand the whole process. So if I just add uh, one factor more to the system, you can see that I'm solving this problem of non-linearity. Um, and I can imagine that this problem of non-linearity will increase the higher the thickness of, uh, of the tablet. Uh, but consider that maybe not directly implemented here in uh, um, in the pro software, but they you can develop your model in a scrambler or uh, in solo. Uh, you can apply also non-linear regression algorithm like super vector machine regression, for example. And you have the possibility here when we were uh, creating uh, our method not only to include. Uh, Let's try to change our uh, method coding. Here, I can also import uh, models that come from Unscrambler. Look here, camo prediction. It means that if I created something that is non-linear, I can add it using the camo prediction system. Yeah. Uh, I, I can see that we have one raised hand, Emiliano. Sorry, but was an icon that was blinking uh, in front of my yeah, face. You are able yeah. to get it. <laughs> so I, I will try to pronounce the name Xiaoling Li. So if Xiaoling Li wants to speak, I open the microphone. Otherwise, if you prefer, you can send uh, the message uh, in the yes, question. Now the, the microphone is open, Xiaoling, if you want to speak with us okay can you hear me yes of yeah. course no thank you for taking my question um i would like to know this technology uh if it can be used for quantitative analysis of the api in the tablet let's say we have yes. finished product uh which yes, is in of the form course. of tablet and i want to know the content of the api can we utilize this uh, technology? 
Yes, yes, of course you can. Uh, if you are at the end of uh, your process and you want to check if the API content is right, uh, you can uh, use, uh, of course, the micro NIR. Um, if you are around, I don't know, what is the percentage of your API inside uh, the tablet, more or less? Okay, so the, the second question is related. Uh, what is the time required to measure the API content? Okay, uh, let me take uh, uh, yeah. this one, Christina. Uh, yeah, obviously, there, here we are told, I mean, there are two folds. One fold is that uh, we are here talking about the process control and uh, uh, we try to find solution to understand the process and to keep under control the process. And, and we try to use the NIR until there is still the possibility to change something in the process. When the tablet is done, it's done, <laughs> okay? So it become a, uh, let's say, a real-time release or uh, a quick quality control. Correct. Okay, uh, frankly speaking, uh, um, the micro NIR can uh, achieve a single uh, spectrum in, uh, let's say, one spectrum without making replicates is around uh, eight milliseconds. Okay. Uh, Second means that uh, uh, you have one single spectrum that maybe it's it's too noisy because uh, I mean it's similar to the Fourier transform. If you increase the number of coaddition, you get a better signal to noise. So to get a decent signal to noise, you are around one second. Okay, one second or half a second in in the best case. The point is, uh, uh, what is the speed? that you have in your tableting machine and uh, uh, for sure uh, is faster uh, than uh, what i'm saying so uh, you can use it but not to do 100 uh, percent of, of your tablets or you need to think to have uh, an array of sensor more than one sensor working simultaneously Consider on top uh, that uh, um, it's not uh, uh, not only to consider the time for acquiring a spectrum that is important, but it's also important to take in account the time to have the tablet in the right position and synchronize the measurement when the tablet is exactly in the center of the sensor. So, I would say uh, it's a quite complex task uh, to do 100% uh, of the tablets, but you can do for sure a high throughput measurement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, if, if I would like to discuss this further, uh, who should I talk to? Uh, we will uh, take a note and contact you. We will uh, address you to the proper account manager. Where are you based? Uh, well, myself based in the United States in California. Okay. Um, yeah, but I think I think my company has contacted you, and we are waiting for the answer. Uh, uh, the issue you just mentioned, like uh, you know, uh, uh, the position and um, the speed, uh, it may not be an issue for us. Uh, what we what we are doing is using three D printing to make a tablet mm -hmm. and we okay. want to do the 100 percent qc okay we, we we can keep the discussion and, uh, yeah yeah they, they, the they, contact you back. okay the 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 real issue is we we want to make sure you know if we put a uh, array like you mentioned it's not cost prohibitive it's for sure uh, it depends on the array i cannot tell you I, I, we need we need to uh to to dive a little bit more and uh, uh I, I am not responsible for the american market i will ask uh, to federico and ed to uh, come back to you as, as soon as possible okay because, uh, i need to know more to give you a proper answer <laughs> yeah that's why i say probably we can take it offline and have more discussion 
Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, I will take a note to contact you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. I will mute you again. Okay. Okay. Okay, Emiliano. Uh, th there is another uh, question uh, that I got uh, is uh, if it's possible to work uh, in the coating pen through the basket, through the metal part. Actually, it's a thing that we try in the really beginning. Uh, we didn't succeed uh, to make a very high quality spectra because especially when there is a, let's say, the basket with the holes, in a static way, you can find a way to acquire through the metal net, but in uh, when the, the basket is starting uh, to rotate, uh, it's becoming not uh, not, real, not really, um, uh, I mean, a, a practical way. Uh, it's also true that uh, uh, when we started going into the coating pen, uh, we were a little bit scared regarding uh, the possibility to scratch the tablets, uh, tablets coating, but actually, it didn't happen, at least with the, with the measurement that you made. Uh, also, because uh, there are also the buffle inside the, 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 the coating pen that can have the same shape of our probe. So uh, it's not, uh, it's, 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 we didn't notice uh, any scratch on the tablet. If there are, uh, other question uh, we don't have a question uh, left in the in the in the question uh, uh, box um, i really want uh, to thank you uh, you are you will uh, get uh, by tomorrow i guess uh, the recording uh, of the, the the session and uh, uh, also the, the presentation in the presentation if you don't have it already you have uh, uh, christina and i email contact uh, and uh, you have also here somewhere the uh, micronear uh, uh, micronear at viavisolution.com uh, email feel free to contact us Emiliano, uh, sorry we have another question okay two <laughs> two <All> other <laughs> questions <laughs> uh, do, do you prefer to answer offline yeah yeah, we okay, will answer. So sorry, I, it's quite quite late. We will answer offline. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> bye, bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.